Are you ready for some inconvenient truths about anti-Semitism and the synagogue of Satan? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, Are you ready for truth? Nothing but the truth. Honesty, candor, speaking the truth, opening the scriptures. Are you ready for that? Because that's what we're going to do today. And by speaking the truth, we will encourage and help some, and we will offend others because not everybody likes the truth. Welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday on the Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown, and I am delighted to be with you. The phone lines are open. LaShawn is here, ready to take your calls. 866-348-7884. So on Thursday, it needs to be Jewish-related, all right? So anything having to do with the Jewish people, Jewish scriptures, Hebrew language, people of Israel, modern Israel, anything Jewish-related at all, we'll take calls on that today, 866-348-7884. And once again, with a smile to all those who are watching, I invite my critics to call. I invite those to call who believe that the Jewish people are responsible for much of the evil in the world today. I invite you to call if you believe that Israel is an apartheid state, that the Israelis are practicing genocide. Don't be a coward if you're able to post online some very ugly and harsh posts against me and the Jewish people, and you have the ability to call in now and don't. Why not? Bring everything into the light, and we'll have a candid discussion. 866-34-TRUTH. All right. Before we open the scriptures, I'm going to lay something out. Everybody, please, give me your best ear. I'm going to give this one more shot. No matter how many times I say this, the opposite gets repeated by the critics, by the anti-Semites, by the bashers, okay? Okay. In the interest of helping those who have an open heart and mind, I'm going to say this again. It is not anti-Semitic to fairly criticize Jewish people. It is not anti-Semitic to fairly criticize the state of Israel. It is not anti-Semitic to take issue with things in Israel today, to point out how gay-friendly the city of Tel Aviv is, to talk about women in the IDF, serving, getting free abortions, talk about how the ultra-Orthodox Jews so militantly oppose the gospel. You can talk about those things freely. You can say, I think the Israelis mistreat the Palestinians. I think the Israelis have at times mistreated the Ethiopian refugees. And you can share those things that doesn't make you an anti-Semite. All right. You can say, man, so liberal Jews, they are, they're like so involved on these leftist causes, be it George Soros and all of his funding of these radical left causes, or be it all these Jewish leaders that are part of the ACLU and the SPLC, these radical leftist groups that that have uh, declared war on conservative Christians, and so many Jews are involved, liberal, secular Jews. That's not being anti-Semitic. That's being honest and accurate. I agree. I agree. That That's not being an anti-Semite. I constantly hear, well, Brown won't let you say, if you say one thing against the Jews, you're an anti-Semite. No, I've said the opposite for decades. Decades. How's that? All right. Well, Brown says you can talk about the Jews and say something positive, but nothing negative. No, I say just when you say the Jews, be accurate in what you say, because if you overgeneralize, that's a problem. So what then is being anti-Semitic? It's when you spread falsehood about the people. It's when you demonize the nation as a whole. It's when you spread misinformation, when you attribute evil to the people as a people in generic broad strokes, that's being anti-Semitic. So I'm setting the record straight, some inconvenient truths for the bashers and the critics. But what's interesting is that, and I've learned this, I mean, I've known this for years, is plenty of people have no interest in hearing a contrary opinion no interest in testing their own views, none at all. And some plainly are cowards. They won't do it. 
They won't have a private dialogue, let alone a public dialogue where their views can be challenged. I wonder why they're so insecure. I wonder why they're afraid to bring their views out into the light of day where they can be honestly sifted and challenged. So for everyone who continues to say online that according to me, if you criticize the Jews, you're an anti-Semite. If you criticize Israel, you're an anti-Semite. That's a blatant falsehood. And now if you repeat it, it is a blatant lie. However, it is anti-Semitic when you demonize the people as a whole, when you spread false accusations against the people, when you spread misinformation against the people that then generates hatred towards the people. That's anti-Semitism. Okay, next thing, next inconvenient truth. Is it true that all Jews today, according to Jesus, are a synagogue of Satan? And they are all fake Jews. They're not really Jews. No. N-O. Did you get that? Capital N, capital O. You say, but, but, but what about Revelation, the second chapter? Let's take a look and see what Jesus says. All right? Revelation chapter 2, he is speaking to the church in Smyrna, beginning verse 8. And to the angel of the church, the congregation in Smyrna. So this is a city in Asia Minor, Turkey today. Right. The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you'll have tribulation, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. And then he says the same thing to the church in Philadelphia about those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So is Jesus saying all Jews who are not saved are fake Jews? And all Jews who are not saved are a synagogue of Satan. No, of course not. Of course not. Number one, it's possible that the people who say they are Jews and are not are actually Gentiles. Oh, didn't Paul uh, warn the believers in Ephesus in Acts 20 about false apostles? And then just a few verses earlier, here in Revelation, the second chapter, Paul said to the believer, excuse me, Jesus says to the believers in Ephesus, that, that you tried those, tested those who claimed to be apostles and were not. So there are people who falsely claim to be apostles. They weren't. This could be Gentile. There are groups that claim to be Jews that are not, all right? These could be Gentiles who are slandering their believers there, who claim to be Jews and were, were a synagogue, a gathering place of Satan. Could be. Could be Gentiles. Or they could be Jews. Let's say they were Jews, all right? They were Jewish people who were opposing the gospel. Jewish people who are slandering the believers and adding to their suffering. And Jesus says, you say you're Jews, you're not. In other words, in that prophetic sense, you're not really a Jew. If, how can you be a Jew and oppose the Jewish Messiah? How can you be a Jew in, in God's sight and fight against his purposes? You say you're a Jew, you're not. You're really synagogue of Satan. So in that sense, in that prophetic sense, yes, Jewish people who oppose the gospel of Jesus are not living as Jews. Jewish people who fight against us as we share the faith and resist the faith. They are not living as Jews. They're living in a way that's displeasing to God. And in that respect, they are a synagogue of Satan. If that's how Jesus means it, fine. Those people that fit in that category, fine. But just do that. It's, it doesn't, it's, it's easy to do these days. I mean, Bible concordances, they're free online. You have them on your cell phone, just everywhere, right? Type in Jew or Jews in English, all right? Whatever translation of the Bible you're reading, if you're reading English, Type in the word Jew or Jews, and then look at all the times it's used in the New Testament to refer to the Jewish people who are not believers in Jesus. For example, over and over and over and over in the book of Acts, I'm just looking at a list here, over and over and over in Acts, okay? Starting in the second chapter where it mentions Jews who are there from around the world, okay? And they're hearing the gospel. And then the Jewish people who are resisting when Paul's message and, and on and on and on. Uh, just the, the Jewish leaders that were happy when Herod was persecuting and, and so on and so forth, all right? Uh, the Jews inciting, Jewish non-believers inciting trouble. Throughout the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, they're called Jews, and God sees them as Jews. So he doesn't see them as fake Jews. He sees them as Jews, but they're not living rightly. He sees them as Jews, but they're outside of the blessing of God and outside of the favor of God because they're outside of Jesus. Jews who reject Jesus the Messiah are as lost as Gentiles who reject Jesus the Messiah. God does not have another way for Jews to be saved outside Jesus. 
Jews need Jesus. I've given a significant portion of my life, joyfully, great privilege to reach Jewish people with the gospel. But God doesn't call them fake Jews. Well, you're all fake Jews if you don't believe in Jesus. No, God calls them Jews, 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 Jews. And here in a prophetic sense, Jesus says, you're not really living like Jews. Look, it's just like in the book of Hosea, when God tells his people Israel because of their sin, lo on me, you're not my people. But then throughout the prophetic books, he keeps calling them my people. My people are ignorant. My people sin. My people don't listen. So they're still his people, but in that spiritual prophetic sense, they're not. So they're still Jews, but in that spiritual prophetic sense, they're not, because they're not living as Jews should live. It'd be like Jesus speaking to believers that are not living right and saying, you're not the church. You're not the church. Wake up. Live like the church. So telling Jewish people, you oppose the gospel. You're not living as Jews should. But just, just here. Let the Bible be your God if you claim to be a Bible believer. Even the passage that's often quoted to say, all Jews are guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus. All Jews displease God. All Jews are hostile to man. First Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 14. All right. If you don't translate with Judeans, which some do, and just translate with Jews, he doesn't call them fake Jews. He calls them Jews. So there's still Jews in God's sight. And, and, and what is... What does Paul say about that? That there, it's still a great benefit to be a Jew because you have the word of God, especially in the ancient world where the Gentile culture did not have it. And what does he say at the beginning of Romans 9? That these people, these Jewish people, these Israelites who do not believe, the promises still belong to them. It's still their spiritual heritage. They're just not enjoying the benefits of it. And they're still loved by God, even if they're enemies for your sake, they're still loved by God because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And God still has purposes for the Jewish people. That's why we're still here. We've been scattered around the world because of sin and disobedience. We've been judged and disciplined by God. Satan's tried to wipe us out, but we're still here because of God's purposes. The one who scattered us is the one who regathered us. And we are not in Israel because of our goodness, but because of his goodness, not because of our faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness. In fact, as he said through the prophet Ezekiel, it's your sin that's making my name be blasphemed around the world, so I'm bringing you back to the land, not for your sake, but for my sake, because my name is being profaned. God is the one who's restored the Jewish people. Let's, let's go to truth here, friends. Let's go to facts, and let's join together in praying that God's promises to the Jewish people will be fulfilled, that hearts and minds will be open, and as Paul wrote in Romans 11:26, that all Israel will be saved. Your calls when we come back. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said, he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org askdrbrown.org and when you go there we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people together we're making a great difference 
Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel. To share on this end-time harvest of Jewish souls and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown here, 866-348-7884 with your Jewish-related questions. Uh, let's go to Ben in Wichita, Kansas. Welcome to the line of fire. Yeah, bit. yeah. I am. I, I I am blown away. I am. I'm thoroughly blown away at your take on Revelation two nine, Revelation three nine, and and you're you're a PhD. I I am so blown away. I, I can barely speak, but I want to get to my question because I know I I know you're probably not going to want to deal with somebody like me. Okay. When did the Jews become Jews, the present-day Jews? Yeah, well, this has been— a... right, let, me, let me just ask you this. Yeah. You know about King Bulan, right? Yeah, there was a, a minor conversion of some of the Khazarians, which make up a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the Jewish population. Right. Yeah, I, I know about okay. that. Yeah. And how—okay, how he basically was responsible for the conversion— of the people who say they are Jews. No, 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 no. That's 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 a complete day. that's a complete misnomer. That's like saying that that the slaves okay, me, like that this. that would be let like saying that the slaves are Caucasian. Co- yeah, Ben, that would be like saying that the slaves are Caucasian. Right. That this that the slaves. Right. I mean, it's a complete right. misnomer. You can't it's, it's, no, no, no. Right. You it's, can't you can't convert to another nationality. You no, 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 no. That's not that's not the like issue. You can convert to Judaism. That's not the issue. Judaism has all kinds of converts. That's why we have so many different colors. That's okay. why we have white right, and black right, and, a- right. and red. No, no. The myth right, is right. that the Khazars are the origin of modern Jews. That's a complete myth. It's been debunked on every level with genetically DNA. Okay, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me pose this question to you. Yeah. Do you believe that the Jews have a physical identity, a physical identity? It's it's yeah it's very but it's varied. You can trace it for DNA, but it's very varied. Okay, it's me, dark, me, dark skin, light skin. Yeah, it's many different skin colors because right, we've, right, right. we've lived in many different countries and intermarried with many different people. Right, 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 right. Now let me say this. Let me ask you this: the story of Moses when he put his hand in his bosom. Yeah, you remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. It said that what color? What color did his hand come out as? Uh, leprous, like white. When he put his hand, when he was told to put his hand in his bosom. Yeah. What did it come out as? White. What color? White. And then he was told. Yeah. Bosom. And then what happened? Have, have you ever met a leper, by the way? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But that's not. Yeah, I'm Moses was definitely. You, Moses was darker when, skin than me. He, but, but let me. Ben, can I just ask you a question? Just curious. Are, are, are you African American? Yeah, yeah. Is your skin black? No. Okay, is my skin white? No, I'm a Jew. I'm not black. I'm not, I'm not black. I am brown. Okay, you're black brown. People are not black. Right, and I'm, white I'm not. not white. I am brown. Exactly. And so I if, if like I, mis- I don't like the connotation of being called black. Okay, fine. All right, so so Ben, Ben, but fine. You get, Ben, Ben, you hang on, Ben. My question of Moses. I answered Moses. it. I answered it five Please. times over, but Ben, okay, if I me, put my hand, Ben, Ben, just let. Ben, Moses was darker skin than me. Who's arguing with that? Okay, now the reason why I ask you that is because he, the heavenly, the heavenly Father, is simply showing us that he and the children of Israel were dark skinned Negro, to be specific. No, they weren't Negro. We know for a fact they weren't That's Negro. All I'm trying to say. No, we know for a fact they weren't Negro. Yeah, but Ben, okay, so let me, let me just try to help you here, okay? Number one, if if I if my hand suddenly became white, that would be quite striking. Here, this is the bottom of this page here is white. It's all right. That's white. So if if my hand came out white, it would be striking. That's number one. Number two, the the Israelites were certainly not Negroid people. There's there's zero evidence of it. Were there Negroid people among them? Yes. Right. But were they Negro people? No. Cer- certainly not, according to all the evidence that I am aware of. Here's the other thing. Shall I show you passages? that speak of the princes of Israel and Lamentations as being white as, as, as wool or white as snow or white like milk 
What does that prove? That they were all Caucasian? No, no. The, the, in all likelihood, the Israelites today were very similar to, say, people living in Egypt. So, you know, light brown skin, something like that. But I could care less if they were Negro, if they were Caucasian, if they were uh, Chinese descent. It doesn't matter to me. None of, none of that's the issue. But again, just try, you know, they're, you're repeating standard myths, like the, the conversion of the Khazars and all that standard myths. I, I do agree with what Billy Graham said while preaching to an African-American audience. He said, Jesus was darker than me and lighter than you. But let it be, whatever skin color, he's our savior. Whatever skin color is, is not the issue to me. But thank you, sir, for, for calling. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Jason in Queens, New York. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Yeah. Hi. Hello? Yeah, you're on the air. Go ahead, Jason. Hi, Dr. Brown. I'm here with my brother, James. How are you, Dr. Brown? Hey, guys. Good to talk to you. Here. I just wanted to say that we, we saw a lot of your debates with Dale Tuggy, Tovia Singer. I actually spoke with Tovia Singer, and I had a question for you. Yeah. Me and my uh, brother over here, we're both uh, philosophers. We're both theologians. We're going for our, uh, for our PhDs. Excellent. And our, our question was on your conception of God. If I was to tell you that God was a necessary being, the source of all existence, right? He's mm-hmm. omnipotent, omniscient, etc. Yeah. Would yeah. you concur with that definition for God? Sure. Sure. Now, if I, for example, were to ask you, can God create a rock that he cannot lift, right? As a theologian, the way I would answer this question is by saying, since he's perfect and necessary in every which fashion, right, there's no way that he can limit his necessity. So he's limited to his perfection, which is not really a limitation. He's just limited to being perfect. Therefore, cannot create a rock that would essentially limit himself, correct? Would you concur with that type of answer? Yeah, or, or also that, and, and by the way, I, I know there are two of you there, but if you have me on speakerphone, it's real hard to hear you. So if you can speak right directly into the phone, that would be... Yeah, much, sure, I took the speaker yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, so, that's um, much better. Yeah, it's also a self-contradictory say. question. But yeah, from the philosophical argument, yeah, that, that makes sense, sure. Yeah, so okay. what I read, I, I do understand that the Christian faith, for example, in John chapter 1, and all throughout the, even through the Old Testament, there are allusions to the fact that God, again, God is a necessary being. The exact opposite of necessity is contingent, meaning dependence on any sort. God, in essence, in principle, is independent, and therefore cannot associate with dependence on any way. He's transcendent to dependence. Now, my philosophical question to you is on the, uh, is on the Christian doctrine. It's not only my question, by the way. All ancient Christian theologians like Athanasius, Augustine, Plotinus, Thomas. Um, we have St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, of course, St. Anselm, Caterbury. We even have, for example, uh, Islamic theologians like Ibn Rashid, Ibn Sina, Jewish theologians mm-hmm. like, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Maimonides, the Ralbagra, the Levins, and Gershon, and Vasaya Dawn. On, on the Christian ideals is in the incarnation of the Trinity. If God is an independent, necessary, self-sufficient being, how could he associate himself or contradict his essence by becoming a man, essentially? How can a necessary entity in nature become a man? Contingent. Contingent. Right. Yeah. So first thing, God himself is not contingent. God can manifest himself in our midst. Uh, God came and ate with Abraham in Genesis, the 18th chapter. God himself with two angels came and ate with him, sat with him, had his feet washed and things like that. But he is, he is simply limiting himself willfully. There is a, a, li- a, a, willful, yeah, self, li- a willful self-limiting uh, for example, in, in, in um, Midrash to Psalm 90, God says that even though he's infinite, he can confine himself to one space in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. So how can course, God— I personally, like, the way I see it, as a logician, the way I see it is if there's a necessary clause. I'm sure you took formal logic. If there's a necessary clause, right, a necessary—and not, not contingently necessary, but necessary in and of itself. Like, for example, the standards of logical rules, like modus ponens, for example, they're necessary laws of logic. There's no way that these laws can ever, for example, be manifested as contingent in any way in their nature. And any manifestation of them can never be truly said to be them. So you, so so you reject is, all aspects of Jewish them. mysticism, then? You reject all aspects of Talmudic yes. teaching? Yes, we do. We're, we're uh-huh. rational. We want to be in traditional Jews. Uh, all right. So, so, so right. Some would claim, like Gershom Sholem, that this is a radical departure from historic Judaism. So, so you, you have to reject the Talmudic views of the Shekhinah being in exile with we the do, Jewish people. I would, 
I would so you're not a Talmudic Jew. You're you're not, you're my my uh, a follower of Rambam, but you're not a Talmudic Jew then. Yes, that's, that's what I would say. I think that's the only rational position you can take. Otherwise, you have to forfeit your logical faculties. Why? Because again, we know in the law in formal logic. I'm a person. I'm a logistician. So we know that there's any formal, formal contradiction in the law right. of logic between two propositions. So, 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 so my mo- God, so, so Rambam is right, and and the Tanaim and Amarayim are wrong. Correct. Okay, let's just assume everyone's wrong. Let's assume everyone's All wrong. Right, wrong. All right. So, so do we my accept is, Isaiah 55, where God says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, and as the heavens are higher than the no, earth, so are my thoughts I would know, higher. Again, my, the entire Bible is up for question. Yeah. Ah, like, oh, okay. okay. So, all right, got it, got it. All right, I, I t- t- tell you what. This is, uh, thank you for making yourself clear. So this is a whole different issue then. Uh, you're, what you're basically saying is your rational view of God precludes the idea of an incarnation or Christian teaching or anything like that. And what I'm saying is God has revealed himself. This is a foundation of Jewish faith. God has revealed himself. We bow down to his revelation. Tell you what, guys, listen, I'm going to be in New York around the first week or so of August, I have a debate scheduled with Rabbi Shmuley. Maybe we can find a time to meet face-to-face. Shoot a note to info at askdrbrown.org, info at askdrbrown.org, and say, you're the callers. It'll get to my assistant. Maybe we can set up a time when I'm there and meet face-to-face. If, if you're up for it and I can schedule it, I want to do it. So my, my phone lines are jammed. I got other stuff to, to, to cover. So I got to cut this off here. But let's continue this face to face. I appreciate your candor, uh, your thinking. Obviously, you're, you're serious, sharp guys. I'd love to continue this face to face if we can. All right. So write to info at askdrbrown.org. Thank you for the call. Much appreciated. So did God create sin? Does the Bible say that God created evil? If that's the case, wouldn't he then be the author of sin, the author of evil? Wouldn't that be contrary to verses that say that God is light and in him is no darkness at all? Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And I want to explain how this verse has sometimes been understood to say that God created evil. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7 says this. So King James, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You say, well, there it says create evil. Well, the new King James correctly changes it to create calamity. Other translations say create disaster. So what, in fact, is this verse saying? The Hebrew word translated evil in the King James or calamity in the new King James is the Hebrew word ra or ra That word means fundamentally something bad. When human beings do something bad, they commit evil. When God brings something bad on someone, say in judgment, then he is creating calamity. He's not creating evil. The idea that God could do evil or create evil is totally contrary to his nature. Everything he does is good and right. That's why the Bible says that God kills and gives life. He puts to death and gives life, but it doesn't say he murders because murder is the unjust taking of a human life. So, no, God does not create evil. That's a mistranslation in the King James. The Hebrew ra'ah always in this context would mean calamity, disaster. When God will say, you've done ra'ah, you've done evil, so I'm going to bring ra'ah, I'm going to bring calamity, disaster. That's the constant context in which these things are found. And even in the verse itself, it's not opposite, it's not good or bad, but it's shalom, peace, or calamity. God's saying, I'm bringing them both. You say, where does evil come from then? That is part of the mystery of free will, be it the free will of the angels in heaven or the free will of, of Adam and Eve on earth, that freedom is given to say yes or no. And if we choose freely, to say no, then that actuates evil. Then evil is actuated through the action of our will. And now born in a fallen world, evil is just part of our world, part of our society, part of our human nature from which we need deliverance and forgiveness through the cross. But does God create sin? Is God the author of evil? Does the Bible teach that? 
Absolutely not. He will work through Satan. He will work through demons. He will work through evil in this world to accomplish his purpose. But his purpose is good. He doesn't do evil. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on The Line of Fire on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Jason and James, if you're still out there, yeah, I, I got a ton of callers and some other material I need to get to. But I would love to continue our discussion, find out more about your background, how you got to where you are today. That would be absolutely fascinating. I, I am not a philosopher. I'm not trained in philosophy. I do understand some of the basic arguments. Yes, I had some training in formal logic, but my great emphasis over the years has been on understanding the actual texts and the languages. So this would be a fascinating conversation. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, replacement theology. I, I want to draw your attention to some Facebook posts that my producer pointed out that I thought I should interact with and, and give some feedback to. I wish I could do it with every post, every comment. I'd love to, but time does not permit that. But, but Marvin Sarah posted this. Replacement theology is foundational for the born-again doctrine. The Jewish leader Nicodemus needs to convert from the old religion of Judaism to the new religion of Christianity, or he won't go to heaven when he dies. But the context is believers not being given kingdom because they love darkness more than they love night, uh, love light. Oh, no, oh, of course, that's a totally false statement and quite anachronistic out of, out of time context as well. There was no such thing as Christianity then. Jesus was not introducing a new religion called Christianity. He was fulfilling what was written in Moses and the prophets, and that was their whole basis to say, it's written, it's written, it's written, it's written. What we're talking about is what the prophets spoke of. Oh, yes, it's new and wonderful, but it's the new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of that would be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not a new religion called Christianity. Again, completely anachronistic and inaccurate as well. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 13 that a scribe, so someone who knows the Hebrew Scriptures, and, and knows the things of the kingdom is like someone who takes from his treasures things old and new. It's the coming together of all of this revelation, which is based in the Hebrew Bible. Remember, the only Bible that the apostles had and that Jesus used was the Old Testament. Yeah, that was their basis for revelation. So it was that which was written is now coming to its fullness. And, and Jesus said, look, you're a teacher in Israel. You should get this. You should understand this. Uh, John replied, a mislabel, it's not replacement theology, it's fulfillment theology. So the concept is that the promises that God gives to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus. So Jew or Gentile in Jesus now receives the promises. Jew or Gentile outside of Jesus doesn't re receive the promises. Therefore, it's not replacement, it's fulfillment. It's the same end result. The promises that God gave to physical Israel, to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with an oath, the promises he gave to them have now been transferred to followers of Jesus who have now replaced physical Israel. It's the same end result. You end up with the same conclusions. Is modern Israel today a fulfillment of prophecy? No. Well, that would be a fruit of replacement theology, even if you call it fulfillment theology. Are there promises that God has that still pertain to the Jewish people as a nation, as a whole? Are there promises he's still given? If you say no, that's replacement theology, even if you call it fulfillment theology. Rachel, uh, John and Vincent, is this clear enough for you? Jeremiah 31, 37, this is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. Great verse. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37, immediately follow the New Covenant passage in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. It's as if God is saying to everyone, yes, I'm changing the covenant, but I'm not changing the people. I'm not replacing the people. I'm giving a new and better covenant, and one that the Gentiles can now enjoy through the Messiah. 
but it is a covenant first and foremost with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And then verses 35 through 37, God said, hey, don't get me wrong here. My promises to Israel remain as long as heaven and earth remain, as long as there's sun, moon, and stars. That, and, and, and until you can explore the depths of the universe the, the, and, and the depths of the earth, my promises to Israel remain. No matter what they do, I'm going to preserve them as a people. Here's the answer from John. Rachel, oh, by the way, their heaven did pass away in 87, if you understand eschatological language in the Bible. With all respect, John, that is bogus nonsense, 100% wrong. Heaven and earth does not refer to the destruction of the temple. Heaven and earth being destroyed, the destruction of the temple in 70. No, 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 absolutely not. That is not the eschatological language of the Bible. And, And let's take a look in Jeremiah chapter 31, all right? You tell me how God could have made himself any plainer. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. Let's take a look at this. You tell me how God could have said it any more plainly than this. Here's what it says. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Has this fixed order departed? Is there still sun today? Moon, stars, have those things continued? Yes. Is that eschatological language referring to the temple? or No, nonsense. Absolutely not. All right. If this fixed order departs from before me, then also might Israel's offspring cease from being a nation. This order is still here. The sun by light, sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon, stars for light by night, the sea still having its waves roar. As long as that's continuing, God says Israel is going to continue as a nation. Then he says this, verse 37, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then will I cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they've done, declares the Lord. So John's statement, their heaven did pass away in AD 70, is completely unrelated to this text anyway. And no, their heaven did not pass away in AD 70. It's it's not biblical language. It's not eschatological language. It's not a Jewish concept. If the heavens above can be measured, can we measure the universe? No. The foundations of the earth can be explored. Have we gone under the earth and explored it? No. God says, when you do that, then I'll cast off all the offspring of Israel. The promises to Israel remain. Israel is under judgment outside of Jesus. Israel is lost outside of Jesus. Jewish people need Jesus. And yet, as Paul writes, they're still loved on account of the fathers for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. That's why we're still here. That's how we've been regathered. And that's why I'm confident that there will be national repentance at the end of the age and all Israel will be saved. <clears throat> there we go. Just, hey, you can take it or leave it in terms of you can take the truth or leave the truth, but you can't deny the truth. You can't deny the truth. All right, let us go back to the phones, and we'll start with Stephen in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brad, how have you been? Very well, thank you. Good. I actually had a question about theology, specifically Peter, before Paul came and rebuked him and told him that Jesus came for the Jew and the Gentile. Why is it? that Peter only thought Jesus came for the Jews initially. Could that be he only saw Jesus in the ministry with the Jews? Did G- was Peter with Jesus uh, in Jesus' ministry um, doing things outside of the Jewish people that Peter was able to see in person? Could you dive into that? Yeah, I, yeah. I know that sure, changed, yeah. but you always hear about the rebuke from Paul. Paul, but you never hear the pre-Peter. Why yeah, okay, so no, number one, the, re, the rebuke in Galatians 2 is not related to that. The rebuke had to do with Peter's hypocrisy, living one way before these Jewish teachers arrived and living differently after they arrived. Okay. P- Peter fully affirmed that Paul was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He had no issue with that. But why didn't he himself go immediately to Gentiles? Why did it take God yes. giving him a revelation yes. in Acts 10? The best explanation is this. He was certainly there when Jesus reached out to the centurion servant in Matthew 8 and said that, that many would come from the east and west and would sit down and feast with Abraham while the children of the kingdom would be excluded so that there are many Gentiles who'd come in and many Jews who'd, who'd be pushed out. He certainly knew that. 
he knew when Jesus healed this, the, the daughter of the, of the Syrophoenician woman in, in Matthew 15, and he knew the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to, to go and make disciples of the nations. But probably, this is what he understood. As he read the scriptures, Jewish repentance would bring us by reaching the Jewish people. And if the Jewish people repent, then that will then usher in God's blessing to the nations. It never dawned on him that the Jewish people as a nation would keep rejecting, and he'd have to now go and bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, he didn't understand that. So there was a, a theological blind spot, uh, but not out of bias as much. It could have been bias, but from what we know, not bias as much as a wrong theology. Because when you, when you read through the prophets, when you read through you know, passages like Isaiah 60 or Isaiah 62, you see as Israel is exalted, that the nations of the world are blessed. And that's probably what he was thinking. Acts 3.19 and following where he calls on his people to repent and turn to God that their sins may be blotted out, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah, right? So Jewish repentance will usher that in and that will then bring God's blessing to the nations, to the Gentiles. That's probably what he was thinking. So put all the emphasis on Jewish repentance and then that will lead to the salvation of the Gentiles uh, so Jewish repentance remains important, but obviously, obviously, uh, Peter got that point of, of order wrong, and God had to open his eyes to it in Acts, the 10th chapter. Hey, thank you for the question. All right, I've just got a minute before the break. Uh, who is this? Uh, Darhead on Twitter. You are retarded. God bless you. Thanks for the very sweet words. I've been getting a lot of sweet words since my Drag Queen article came out yesterday. A lot of sweet words just like that, except many that I couldn't repeat on the air. May the Lord bless you and give you an awesome day of revelation of who he is, Darhead. Um, okay, listen, you know we're on the front lines. You know we're pushing hard. You know we're not holding back. We do it with your help. Would you help amplify my voice and enable us to reach more people even more effectively with more material? You can do it by becoming a Patreon partner. Just Pennies a day, 30-something cents a day, so $10 or more per month. What a great, great opportunity. And you also get two bonus videos every single week, so you'll help us reach more people, all right? And we'll bless you back in turn. So go there now. Can you do that? Patreon.com forward slash Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R Brown. We're about 149 Patreon partners. We'd like to get to 1,000 ultimately, but... Let's get to 160, 170 today. Join the team, patreon.com forward slash Dr. Brown. We'll be right back with more of your calls. You know, we talk about scriptures being the word of God. It's also clear they were written by human beings, that, that Paul tells Timothy, hey, please bring my cloak, you know, it's going to be cold here in the winter when I'm in prison. And it's interesting that when Ezekiel says, thus saith the Lord, that his words come out different than when Isaiah says, thus saith the Lord, or Jeremiah says, thus saith the Lord. So how do we explain that? Is the Bible written by God or men? 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God. How can it be breathed out by God and yet come in so many different human forms? Someone used this analogy once. When the light shines through a window, that the, the light on one side of the window is slightly different than on the other side. What if the light shined through colored glass? Now it's going to come out very different on the other side. But what if God, who made the light, also made the glass so that through the multicolored panels on that glass window, that stained glass window, the light came out on the other side just the way he intended. So yes, of course, the Bible is full of humanity. It's full of human emotion. The Bible is full of human expression and human vocabulary and human distinctives from one culture to another. And yet it is breathed out by God so that we get the very word of God, just what God wanted to communicate to us, we get in an absolutely inspired, infallible form. So yes, it is the word of God through men, 
but inspired by God, breathed out by God, so we can say the Scriptures are the Word of God. The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday on the line of fire, 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go over to Diane in Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. I just have one quick question for you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the the ancient Hebrew and Greek uh, scriptures, you know, in the mm-hmm. Old and New Testament. Yep. If you're aware of any resources or books where um, where anyone has translated that into expanded English. Expanded English. So you mean kind mm-hmm. of like a, a paraphrase type thing? Yeah, where it really goes into great detail. Uh, the reason I'm asking is I had read this book by Marcus, uh, Warren Marcus, where he talks about number six and uh, the priestly uh, blessing. And he went, then he went and broke it down into an expanded English. And the word, what it really means is just so much deeper than what we read in the English. And I just wondered if anyone else had maybe ever written any. A yeah. Bible or a yeah. Book so, about so, that kind of thing. yeah. Diane uh, Warren's a friend, and and it really sought to open up the the meaning there. The problem is, in, in a translation, you can't. Um, if you have something like the Amplified Bible, for example, which is what this tries to do, the Amplified Bible, it tries to expand mm-hmm. on the meaning of every word, but often it's telling you too much. In other words, every word, just as you and I are having a conversation and we're understanding each other. That's how the Hebrew and Greek also operate. They're not magical languages with all kinds of extra meanings. But if you want to dig in, here's a real simple place you can go online, okay? Type in N-E-T Bible as a new English translation, N-E-T Bible. It'll take you to a website. And when you click on read, on the left side will be the, the Bible in English. And on the right side, detailed notes about the meaning of the Hebrew and the Greek. Some very technical, some not as technical, but every word, wherever you can open it up and there's more meaning, they'll be discussing the meaning, how to translate it. So N-E-T Bible, right? As in net, N-E-T Bible. You'll go to that site and then when you, you can read all about it. When you click on read, then it'll get you into the actual Bible. So that will be on the left. You just type in what passage you want to read. And on the right, will be TN, that's translator notes, why they translate it the way they did, SN, study notes, why, uh, further insight for study, and then another will be a text critical note when there's a dispute about the Hebrew or Greek text. At least you'll understand why translators do what they do, what's behind it, what goes into it. There are close to 60,000 notes there that you'll find very practical and helpful. Hey, Diane, thank you for the call. Uh, oh, also, uh, Diane, go on our website, AskDrBrown.org. Thanks for the reminder, Kai. Uh, ASKDRBrown.org. And I interviewed Warren Marcus about this very thing. So just type in Warren or Marcus, and you'll you'll get that information. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Jeremy. Are we going to Jeremy? You know what? I've got. I've just got to deal with this. There's like a little fly or bug or something around my mic. And if some of you are watching, it's like, what is he looking at? That that's what I'm looking. All right, hang on. We're gonna get this thing. Just get it away. There we go. That's better. That's better. Nothing's gonna stop us. Not demons, not flies. Nothing. <clears throat> All right. Uh over to Pennsylvania. Matt, welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Hey. Hi, um, um, I'm a fan of all your work and grateful for all your work. I just had a quick question um, about the Samaritans. Yeah. Um, in the first century, did, did Jews see Samaritans as Jews, or is it different than how they treat the Gentiles because of like how Peter needs the whole vision and stuff? 
to go up to Cornelius, but when Philip goes to Samaria, he just baptizes them. Yeah, uh, Matt, first, thanks for your kind words. Appreciate that. Uh, the, the Jewish people, by and large, looked at the Samaritans as half-breeds. Uh, we know from 2 Kings 17 that when the Assyrians exiled the, the northern Israelites, that they then brought in people from the other nations to, to live where the Israelites lived. So that was a way of shifting populations, and it really takes away patriotism and desire to fight and things like that. And that, so there are some Israelites that remained, and they then intermarried with these Gentiles. And, and according to the Jewish view, that's the origin of the Samaritans, so that they're half-breeds and that they're, they're really not authentic. So they were looked at negatively. So that's why the disciples in John 4 are surprised Jesus is talking to a woman, and on top of it, a Samaritan woman. That was a surprise. The Samaritans, to this day, see themselves as the pure breeds. They believe that they are the true Israelites, that their version of the Torah is the most accurate, that their traditions are the most accurate, and, and that uh, the changes that came in Judaism are to be rejected. So, so they still remain to this day a very small group. In their view, they are the original Israelites. In the view of the Jewish community 2,000 years ago, they were half-breeds. Uh, today, they're just looked at as a sect within Judaism. Okay, thank you. You are very, very welcome. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Mark. Are you calling from Brazil, sir? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Great. Well, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, the, the question that I had, I was wanting to kind of ask because I, um, well, I was pretty much raised raised up in sort of traditional Protestant church in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And after studying Hebrew, I started kind of questioning maybe some of the, the differences that, that I'm seeing right now. And, you know, I'm wondering, you know, as far because Jesus said to follow the law, and to to obey the law, but he also criticizes the, the Pharisees for following traditions of men. So, what would we define as maybe obeying the word or following the law? Yeah, well, to doing traditions of men. Yeah, today? first because, thing, Jesus never called Gentile believers to follow the law of Moses, and he inaugurated the new and better covenant. So we're no longer under the Sinai covenant. No. no no Jewish follower of Jesus, no Gentile follower of Jesus is under the Sinai covenant today. Uh, we, we are under a new and better covenant, and God writes his laws in our heart. You say, well, how do I sort that out? Well, I would read through the New Testament. and Whatever the New Testament reemphasizes <clears throat> that was taught in the Old Testament, take that as part of the new and better covenant. And anything that gets in the way of the spirit of the word, human traditions, be they Christian traditions or Jewish traditions, we reject those. So the best thing to do is to okay. really maintain a vibrant relationship with the Lord where Jesus is central to you, where loving God is central to you, where sharing the good news is central to you. And then instead of looking at it as, as, as something like you have to put on in the negative sense, look at it as something that God will write on your heart through his word and by his spirit. And it becomes then a joy to do these things. If you conclude that the seventh day Sabbath is something pleasing to the Lord you should live out. You live that out before the Lord as, as a gift from God, but not in a legalistic way and not with all kinds of man-made traditions added in. And if you conclude before God that every day is equally holy and you find rest in Yeshua, then you, you live that out joyfully, but you don't divide over it. And again, really simply, look to see what's re-emphasized in the New Testament and then live that out. That would be an expression of New Covenant life. Hey, I appreciate it very much, Mark. And um, I, I just want to go to a, a YouTube comment. Uh, let's see here from Donna. Jesus Yeshua is Messiah. We agree on that. Not Israel. Christian Zion. All right, so who says Israel is the Messiah? Nobody. Israel needs the Messiah. Christian Zion is a Messianic Judaism mother, false prophet of Revelation, Christians need to realize they're being brainwashed by Zionists who worship the Antichrist. You know, Donna, you are so in error there. You are so off base. 
so unbelievably off base. A Christian Zionist simply believes God keeps his promise. That's all. You have a problem with that. Are you going to tell me I'm worshiping the Antichrist because I say God keeps his promise? God can't lie? If he said he's going to give the land to the people of Israel, he's going to do it? Is, is that, <clears throat> is, is, is that um, worshiping the Antichrist to say God's faithful? He keeps his word? He keeps his promise? I, I believe God. To say that's worshiping the Antichrist, boy, are you in serious error there. And, and, and then Messianic Judaism is the false prophet of Revelation. Messianic Judaism is what Paul and Peter practice. That's a Jew following Jesus, living as a new covenant Jew. That's it. So I, I, I'm not concerned for my sake. I'm concerned for your sake because there's so much God wants to bless you with. And when you recognize his faithfulness to Israel, despite Israel's sin, Israel needs the Messiah. Jewish people need Jesus. So we agree on that, all right? But when you recognize how God's been faithful to the people of Israel despite our sin and our failure, that should encourage you that he wants to be faithful to you and help you as well. Hey, a question I just saw posted in YouTube chat, is modern Hebrew pronounced the same as biblical Hebrew? No, there have been many changes in the pronunciation. Um, Arabic retains more uh, similarity in pronunciation to consonants and vowels than modern Hebrew does, although Arabic has some changes as well. You know, modern Hebrew is pronounced in, in many ways differently, just like modern Greek is pronounced differently than classical Greek. Hey friends, 15 minutes from now, I'm gonna come back on YouTube, the Ask Dr. Brown channel on YouTube and do an exclusive Q&A YouTube chat. So I will join you there shortly.